associated with it a um, number of hours. And then we'll ask the project how much is this going to cost. All right? And um, we'll ask the project how much revenue we're going to get from it. So we'll use those methods in the consultant in association with some of the attributes and methods in the project to come up with uh, that. But we're first going to develop the, the, the consultant object, or consultant class rather, and then we'll go and we'll test it, make sure that works, and then we'll develop the project class. So let's go in and let's make our project class. Public class. I always have to look back to make sure the capitalization and all that. Whoops, not with that file, I don't. Public class. Yeah, there we go. Consultant. And the brackets go around the code for the consultant. Now, uh, a few things about Java Convention to repeat, and a few things about the way I want to do things uh, for this class. In, in this class, I want to make sure every one of your classes has its own file. So some of you didn't do that for an assignment. And if you've already done the assignment that way, don't worry about it, or you've combined classes in a file. But just the next assignment that you do, make sure each class has its own file. The other thing is by convention, the first letter of the class name is capitalized. So in this case, it's, it's consultant. Uh, some people had lowercase uh, for that. Again, that sort of helps us keep things straight as by convention, classes are capitalized and primitives are not capitalized. So it's just, you want to sort of follow the flow. So these are sort of, uh, you know, um, conventions that, that all Java developers, uh, or most Java developers use, and, and that really helps a, a bit with the readability of the code. So I'll go and I will define, yeah, go ahead. Um, in the book I noticed they don't use public. Um, it's probably implied. It, it's probably if you do not define it as public, it is assumed to be public. All right. Um, in, in this case, uh, let's think this through. In this case, um, there really wouldn't be much of a point to make a class that would be private, because then no one could use it. You know, um, I'm, I'm trying to think. You know, this sort of class you wouldn't make private because the whole point of this class is that that um, other classes are going to use it, and and it's going to be a com our component that we're going to plug in wherever we need a consultant. So it might be a situation where you want a private class. Later on, we'll talk about some inner classes and all that, um, like the handle events uh, in a GUI. Those might be private because um, the outside world isn't going to address them, but within a class, you may access some of these others. At, at any rate, um, uh, that, that's a good question. Uh, it, that, I'm sure that's probably the, the default, and, and again, um, you know, it doesn't hurt to explicitly say it. All right. Um, I'm going to set my instance variables to private. These attributes are sometimes called instance variables. And they're called instance variables because every instance of this class, that is every object, can have their own values for them. So every consultant will have their own name. Every consultant will have their own um, employee type. So private string. Name, private, string, type. I'm going to create my, now I'm intrigued. I'm trying to think, when would I ever want a private class? I don't know. It's a great question. So at any rate, uh, let's forget about that for now. Let's make our constructor. So I'll make my consultant constructor, and I'll make one of them to um, 
except an argument for name and one of them to accept an argument of both the name and the type. Now, One thing that I often do when I develop uh, code is I will write out all the what are called signatures of the functions first. By signature of the function I mean what it's calling, uh, or, uh, what, what it's called rather, the name of the function, what arguments are passed to it and the return values. Because I may have one function use another function so I want to sort of define all my functions first. I may in some cases even create a stub function. And what a stub function is, is just essentially where you, you don't write the whole function, you just maybe uh, hard code a value in that later on you're actually going to calculate. So for example, my get wage rate function. I know that that depends on the type, but to start out I might just return 30 as the wage rate. And again, of course, I know I can't leave it like that, but I can at least maybe write my code, do some compiling, maybe do some testing prior to I have everything set. You know, I'm a big believer in, in doing things very incrementally, not, not trying to, to do everything all at once. So I'm going to go and I'm going to write out the other methods I need. And I will need a set set name that will accept a arg a set type that will accept an argument a get type that will return a string and will have no argument. A get name that will return a string and have no argument. Then finally the two methods that um, do calculation, a public double get pay rate and get billing rate. All right. Now, let's go in and 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 bring some of these to life. And what I said before is I'm going to, uh, this one, in order to uh, make sure that we're only setting an attribute in one place, I'm going to have this call the set function on, on the, the name. So I will say this set name arg name. Again, the benefit of this is if there is some sort of validation that we're going to put up where we're going to throw an exception. Not necessarily with name. I guess we could validate for there to be an em not be an empty string or something like that. But for type, maybe, whereas you know, it has to be one of those allowable values, all we have to do is have that code that tests that in one place. So even down here, where I, I have the constructor to set both of them, I could say arg ty or, uh, type equals arg type, but then if there were any validation for that, I'd have to repeat that in, in both places. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the call to the set type method, and then when we get around to writing validation for this, we only have to get it to work in the one place, because everyone that sets this is going to be using that. But, valuation, uh, but validation is a little bit down the road, so we're not uh, going to do that right now. And my set will simply take the name and set the argument to it, or set it to the argument, take the type 
and set it to the argument. The gets are simply going to return those. All right. Now here's where we're going. We need to test the type. Now I had a question uh, from a student last time, just as class was ending. I think it was af actually after I finished recording class. I think it was just sort of a one-on-one. -on -one. And the question was: Is I could do something like this if type equals r, let's say, then do something. And the question was made, do I want this method to uh, uh, um, use the attribute or do I want to have it go through the get method? And that's a, generally a good idea. Um, I think it's less of an issue with the, um, than with the set because this is inside this class. So it's okay that this class knows about the fact that there's a get attribute or, or that there's a type attribute. Um, it's less of an issue than when you're talking about the outside world addressing it. So it probably would be good practice for us to use the get method instead of accessing the type um, directly. Then if anything really, if, if there were some kind of flukes with the uh, getting the type of consultant, then we'd be sure to get that code as well. For example, just a, as a given, um, in, in a consulting firm I worked for, someone might be a senior consultant, but they may be working on a project that only requires a consultant. So they may be still getting paid at their regular senior consultant rate, but they might be billing at just the regular consultant rate. So there could be some kind of goofy calculation in there in calculating one or the other. So at any rate, because of that, we'll use the this.get type as opposed to accessing the attribute directly. All right. Um, not a huge deal either way, not a, quite as big a deal as when you're talking about the outside world addressing things. Uh, all right. And what I say, I said if the rate was or if the type was equal to J, that is they're a junior consultant, then the rate equals $20 um, an hour. Now, it's legal to do this, return 20. All right. I don't like that style of code. I only like there to be one return at the very bottom of the method. I think that is a, uh, a cleaner, a better way to write it. So what I will do in all my methods like this is I will have, I'll declare a, a variable uh, inside here. You know, I could call it result maybe. And I could say result equals 20. And then at the very end, I'll return the result. And then I will have a comparable thing for the other two consultant types. I do realize that I made a mistake up here in this constructor. I, I feel like I'm a little tongue-tied and addle-brained today, so uh, bear with me a bit. One mistake that I make here. If you remember, I said if there was no type... Uh, defined, I would want to default the type to regular consultant. So I should say in this case, this dot set type R, like that. Now let's think this through. This guarantees that for every consultant object that I create, the name and the type will both be populated, right? Because 
I'm defining some, console, uh, some constructors of my own, so therefore I can't use the no argument constructor that might be available to me had I not defined any uh, constructors of my own. Therefore, I have to use one of these two constructors, either the one that accepts a single string that will set the name, or this one that will accept two strings, a name and a type. Both of these constructors set both variables. This one sets the type to whatever's passed to it. This one defaults the type to R for regular consultant. All right, and both of them set the name to whatever argument was, was set it. So by thinking this through, um, through either constructor, it's going to have a value for both variables, both instance variables. All right, let's write a little, oh, get bill rate we have to do. And again, what I can say is I can do a similar thing. I can declare a double of result. I can say result equals, I said three times their pay rate, so three times this dot get pay rate, and then return result. All right? And we should be good to go to test this class. So let's go and save it. I'm going to save it in my Java folder. All right. Then I'm going to create a test class that I'll use for various purposes throughout this. And I'll call it test Java. Create my main method. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to define some test cases here. I'm going to test that if I use the one argument constructor, that it will properly set the name and the rate. So I will say oops, consultant. C equals new consultant. And we'll call the one argument constructor and we'll only pass it a value of Mike and we won't pass it a type. Now we know from the constructor that it's going to default the type to R. So I'm going to go system dot out dot print ln. Test case one. And I'm simply going to make through sure that all these methods do what I would expect them to.
All right, so let's save this, compile it, and test it. This by no means will be the only test case. This will test one specific um, condition. Return result may have not have been initialized. Okay, that should be easy enough to take. And it said it was in consultant line 47. In this newfangled uh, notepad plus plus that shows you the line numbers, you can also go in and put the status bar in and find line 47, which is down here, and I'm just going to put in this line to initialize it to zero, and we'll do the same thing here. Actually, we don't need to do that there. The reason, again, it gave that is the compiler is smart enough to know that if none of these conditions were true, would get down here and never set the value of that. In this case, because that's not surrounded by an if statement, we don't run that risk. So let's go and save that and compile it. And it works. All right. Test case one, name is Mike, type is R for regular consultant, the pay rate is $30 an hour, the bill rate is 90 Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. So we're done testing. We can go home. No, of course not. All right. We have other test cases. For example, I would want to make sure that what if I use the, no arg or the one argument constructor and then manually set the type? I want to make sure that code works. Right? Because so far, I've tested this method. Let's see. And that tests some of these other methods. And then I've tested this one. I want to make sure I cover all the possible conditions. Now, there's really two strategies as far as testing goes. And they're called white box and black box. Black box is where you assume you don't know anything about the inside of the code. All right. White box is where you sort of uh, have the opposite assumption, that you look inside the code and see. So for example, this actually called the set type function. So I could take that as evidence that the set type function is correct. Um, not be certain that it's correct, but take that as, as, as a test case for that function as well. All right. Black box testing would say, hey, I don't know what's going, inside in, in, going on inside that uh, class. So I better test if I set it this way or if I set it this way. So we'll go in and we'll generate another test case. where I create a second object and in addition to initializing it this way, I will manually go and set the type to, let's say, senior. Then I'll go and compile this. All 
All right. So if I create it with the one argument con uh, constructor and then call and manually set it, that worked as well. All right. Then I could have a test case for the two argument constructor. blank line in between them. All right, and that seemed to work as well. Now, is this enough test cases? It depends on which philosophy of testing you're taking. Um, I am pretty sure I'd have to go back and double check, but we've hit every line of code, all right? If I assume that I know what those lines of code are, right? We hit that constructor, right? We hit this constructor. We hit that when we called each of those constructors. We hit that when we called this constructor plus we manually called it. Um, we, we definitely hit the gets for those two. We got the pay rate and we got the billing rate. And for the pay rate, we hit all three possible conditions. So really, in this case, if I know what the code is, and I'm, I'm taking on, quote, white box testing, I can see inside it and I know really I've hit all the code. So I might be happy with this testing, all right? If I am taking the opposite philosophy that says, okay, I'm going to do black box testing where I don't, I'm going to assume I don't know anything that goes on in that, all right, I would really have to do a lot more test cases to really be assured that, that I've hit all those possibilities. I'd have to first use the one, uh, one uh, constructor, one argument constructor, uh, then call the one argument constructor and set the value to that, then call the one argument constructor and set the type to something else. Then call the one constructor and set the name. So I'd really have to do a lot more testing if I don't, if I don't assume that I know what the code is. Um, I think white box testing is acceptable and um, really it's probably the only way to, to avoid going crazy. All right, Because if you start adding up all the possible things you could do with those classes, um, you're going you're gonna to end up with a, a quite, uh, quite more formidable list. All right, but the idea is is that you're going to design these test cases to make sure you've hit every line of code, or you should design these. So if I was doing this beforehand, I would come up with a test plan. In in, in uh, uh, effectively, this this is th this main uh, uh, method is my test plan, the different conditions that I'm testing it for. Uh, but it's probably a good idea to develop that you know, prior to it. So now we've done what, what is called component testing on this. In other words, we're pretty sure that this component itself works and it does what it's supposed to do. Uh, at some point, we're going to maybe create another component and then integrate test them together. All right. So any questions about the consultant class? On to the project class. What's going to be in our project class? Our project class is going to have three instance variables. It's going to have a double for the number of hours the project is for. It's going to have a string for the customer name. And it will have 
a consultant that's going to be working this particular um, project. All right. Again, we're, uh, we're making some assumptions here. Uh, and again, we talked about refactoring and how we could take and improve this and make it better. Our two assumptions or two sort of shortcuts that we're taking is customer probably should be its own class. We probably shouldn't simply be having a, uh, you know, a name for a customer. We should have a customer class. Because if you think about it, a customer is not just a name, a customer is an entity, right? There would be multiple attributes for a customer and multiple behaviors that a customer is likely to perform, all right? But in the interest of, of simplifying it, we're just going to keep track of the customer's name. The other thing is, is there could very well be more than one consultant uh, on a project. And again, we're, we're making that assumption that there's only one, just to simplify things. But at some point, we can possibly go back and, 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 and look at that, all right, and, and add so that there could be multiple consultants for the project. All right, I'm going to make only one constructor, all right. And if you think about it, you can read the chicken scratch here. My consultant class, it seemed to me that two constructors were appropriate. Why? Because I can set the name and take the default for the, for the consultant type based on the way I narrated the problem. The default cons uh, uh, consultant type is a regular consultant. All right. Or I could set the name and set the consultant type. Both of those seem legit to me. And when I'm done, my consultant object is populated correctly. All right. In this case, though, I can't really assume a default number of hours for a project. I can't really assume a default customer for a project. And I really can't assume a default consultant for an object, uh, for, for this object, for this project. So it really doesn't make sense to me to create this um, and set defaults. Now I could do a couple of things. I, I could create a, a no argument constructor and they, they would have to fill in those when they were known. And I could do that. Uh, but uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create simply one constructor for this that will accept all three arguments. Now, what are the arguments? I'm going to have an argument that's a double for the hours. A, a, a string for the customer and a consultant object for the consultant. All right. So I can pass to and I can pass an argument to a function that isn't a primitive, like a double, all right, but itself is an object reference. Now, Remember, though, the way the object reference works. That is, it's going to create a pointer, and it's going to pass a pointer to this uh, function. And so we're, we're, we're not, it's not like with doubles, all right? It is, it is uh, not passing the actual data, it's passing a pointer to the data. All right. I will then have a variety of get and set methods on this to get and set each of these attributes individually. I want to kind of get to a certain point in this uh, project today. So I may omit those today. And we'll fill in those uh, at some future time. They're, they're, they're pretty non-exciting uh, uh, functions. All right. I don't think you're going you're gonna to miss much by not seeing them. If you want to, in the, you know, if you really uh, you know, want to dot the T's and cross the I's, you could uh, go in and fill in these methods yourself, the gets and sets. But what, I'm, what I am going to do is I'm going to create two functions um, to calculate how much revenue my consulting company is going to get and calculate how much, um, what wages I'm going to pay my consultant, right? So, how do we calculate how much revenue we're going to get for this project? Well, 
We know the hours, right? And how much is the customer going to pay per hour? They're going to pay the consultant's billing rate per hour. So, to calculate revenue, we're going to take hours time the consultant's billing rate. So that's the revenue for this uh, project. What's the cost of this project or the expense for this project? It'll be the hours times the wage rate for that um, consultant. I could then do calculate gross profit, which would simply be the revenue minus expenses. This is a case of delegation. All right. In other words, the project class delegates a piece of that calculation to another object. In other words, the project class knows what the hours are associated with it. And it asks the other object, G, what's your billing rate? G, what's your wage rate? And then it does the calculation. Um, we talked about different ways that classes can relate to each other. Uh, I've heard a number of different terms uh, described. Um, this is an example of, I've heard it called association, where this associates with that. All right. Uh, delegation, because the, the project is delegating part of the calculation to the other class. In, in just English terms, the project has a consultant. Now next week or wh at whatever point we start talking about inheritance relationships, we'll see that the wording is going to be different. We're going to say there's an is a relationship. Maybe a specialist is a consultant but they're a special consultant, right? They maybe get paid differently, or maybe they, their billing rate is calculated differently. All right? But a project is not a consultant, and a consultant is not a project. They simply use each other. A consultant is used on a project. So this is one way of these classes relating to each other, or communicating, or however you want to say, association. So let's go and let's build this, and let's build at least one test case. So. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually leave this test Java as it is, all right? This is not real code that's going to go into my application. It's just sort of a unit test. I'm actually going to make another test uh, class to test the, the project and the consultant together. So let's go in and let's create our project class. Customer. Um, I'm going to create my project constructor that's going to accept a string for the customer. A double for the hours. And a consultant object reference for the consultant. And what is this going to do? This will go in and it will say customer equals our cost hours equals arg hours 
C equals arg C. Now, um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to do the revenue calculation today. All right, and we'll test that, and then we can fill in the rest of the, the, the methods on, on Monday, and then maybe even extend this a little bit further. But I'm going to create a public method that's going to return a double for, uh, and we're going to call it calculate revenue. And I'm going to say double result result equals hours times c dot get billing rate or is it get bill rate let me look get bill rate And then I'll return that. All right. Oh, sorry about that. Here's what I have. I declared my instance variables. I declared my constructor to take the three arguments. And then I created my calculate revenue that's going to take the hours and multiply it by the consultant that's associated with this project's billing rate. So here's my three instance variables, the three things that I said the, cons uh, the project's going to have, the customer, the number of hours, and the consultant. Here's my constructor that initializes those. So that's the only way I can make a project is by giving it a customer name, a number of hours, and a consultant object reference. And I, I set those instance variables. Then my calculate revenue says, hey, well, calculate the revenue by taking the hours that are associated with this project and multiply that by the billing rate of the consultant that's associated with this project. And I apologize for not having the projector on. I didn't realize it was off. All right. So let's make a test class. To test this. And I guess we could do it any old way that we want it. I'll do this. I'll create my consultant class. Create consultant. See new consultant Mike. I will create my project. And what do I have to give it? I have to give it the customer name. Watch too many Roadrunner cartoons growing up. Number of hours for this project, we'll say 100. And what is the consultant associated with this? Well, it's going to be Mike. Mike is going to be working on this. So I pass that object reference there. So I can then go and say system dot out Let's see if this works. Thank you. Thanks. All 
All right. So the revenue from this is $9,000. Is that correct? Well, the revenue is $100 times whatever the consultant's um, billing rate is. Mike is a regular consultant, right? We defined him by using the one argument constructor. So therefore, as a regular construct, uh, consultant, um, his pay rate is $30 an hour. His billing rate will be three times that, or $90 an hour. 90 times 100 is 9,000. So, hey, that one worked. All right? We're, we're, we're a, a far way from ensuring that everything works and everything works together. All right? But we have, we have associated, again, the, the, the consultant class with the project class. Now, an effective way to go through this we might do next Monday if we have two people that aren't camera shy. All right? And that's where actually people take the role of one of the classes or one of the objects. So maybe I'll be the test class. One of you will be the project class. One of you will be the um, consultant class. And I will set parameters. I'll tell you, hey, Set your name to Joe. Set your consultant type to S for senior. And then we go through and walk through. That oftentimes is called a walkthrough. All right? And it's good for two purposes. One, I think, is good to learn sort of the, the, the way that object-oriented stuff works and, and, and to get this kind of thing straight. The other thing it's used for is to use even with experienced developers when they want to make sure that they have written their functions correctly. All right? It's a good way to walk through because, again, you know, you, you kind of, it's a good way to sort of expose any flaws in the design of your classes by going through and walk through. So I hope we have at least two volunteers um, to, to play a role of, of a, uh, if you've always wanted to be an actor, you know, this will be a, a chance for you to show off your, your skills. Uh, and we'll see you Monday then. All right.